the educated low carber could say to the vegan, mm -hmm. hey, well, you're trying to invoke this concept of lipotoxicity. And in fact, when we look at palmitate, which is the main circulating saturated fat in the body, in the blood, the main source of that is um, lipogenesis, de novo lipogenesis in the liver, where the liver is taking acetyl-CoA and saying, hey, acetyl-CoA, you have all these options, but insulin's high, I want you to turn it into palmitate. And that's going to happen, of course, if insulin's elevated, so too is palmitate production, and thus the low carber can say, well, I have lower insulin than you, probably. Um, thus, it's possible that you have more lipotoxicity than I do, and, and there is tremendous justification for that. So we're in Salt Lake, we, you and I, since you're watching this, you're with me. <laughs> uh, we're in Salt Lake City. I landed a little bit late, um, had a layover in Denver. Oh man, the flight was so bumpy, crazy. And uh, Southwest is having a bunch of crazy stuff going on. Anyway, I love Southwest, I've, I use them a lot, but uh, I do always say a few prayers when I'm on the flight. Uh, so first things first, you know, when you go to a new city, when you're traveling, I love to get mineral water, all right? So uh, uh, many of you, you, you you're low carb, you're keto, uh, you're carnivorous, whatever your diet is, it's probably uh, low in carbohydrates. You need to um, get your minerals. As you saw, I mean, even before James to Nick, James to Nick Lantonio, the author of this salt fix, um, before the interview, before I read his book, actually, uh, you know, I, 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 I've been a huge fan of Gerald Steiner for a while, and I'm so glad that he thinks it's one of the best mineral water. So here we go. So tomorrow we're going to meet with Ben Bickman. It's going to be part two. I know a lot of you guys have watched that video. I think it's got 190,000 some odd views. Uh, we're going to have a lot of fun talking about glucagon, talking about carnitine and some of the new things about brown adipose tissue and its links with ketosis. We're talking about that. But um, yeah, I'm going to do more vlogs like this to give you guys a little bit behind the scenes. So I'll show you a little bit of a snippet uh, later on in this video about, about that interview with Dr. Ben Bickman. But if you didn't know, I do a low res cut. Uh, and then I put it up in our members area in our fat adapted insider access so that you have access to the to the new content before we, we roll it out because we're really ahead when it comes to podcasts. So if you want to dive into it now, there'll be a link below this video. But uh, just some tools when you travel to give you guys some ideas about, you know, th some of the things because I do travel a lot. Um, not that that's a good or healthy thing. I'm starting to get wrinkles and gray hair and all that sort of stuff. Traveling is very hard on the body. Uh, I think it has to do with the ionizing radiation one, probably the air quality being fairly poor. And then you have Wi-Fi in, as my friend Roland talks about, uh, Wi-Fi in a metal tube. So it's not really good for your whole electromagnetic balance. Right, so when you travel, what, how can you mitigate some of that? Um, you know, balancing your body's circadian rhythms, get, getting sunlight first thing in the morning. Uh, getting the mineral water, salting, and just making sure you're not um, totally having erratic meals and things like that. When I say erratic, you know, remember your gut clock um, is entrained and is becoming synchronized not only by your circadian rhythms and light exposure and sleep-wake cycles, but also food intake. So that, that kind of meal consistency there and trying to eat in your same time zone can help. All right, another sip of water, then we're going to 24-hour fitness. So uh, I'm going to take you through a workout right now. We're going to do triceps. We're going to do shoulders. So I'm going to do a little bit of a different tricep move, but I want to show you what my favorite tricep move ever. And I learned this back in, it was the late nineties from Paul Dillette. Google his name. He used to have these mat. He, I don't. He doesn't work out anymore. I guess he's injured. I don't know what. He's. I think he's kind of overweight now. But anyway, he had this this really good tricep tutorial in uh, Flex magazine. I remember reading back, and it was 1999. I was a junior in high school. I was so excited about it, and I've been using it ever since in different variations of that. So it's it's basically a French press. And the gym that I just went to, 24 Hour Fitness, they didn't have the ability to like move the benches, the incline bench around uh, into the racks, into the pulley systems to do this particular tricep move. So I had to improvise and that's what's so cool about working out once you come, or, and with keto, with anything in life, in life, 
once you understand something, you can improvise and improve on it and so forth. So uh, shoulders and triceps, and I did a little chest, just a little bit. I, for me, uh, chest is a slow muscle for me to like grow and maintain. Uh, so what I need to do is train it twice a week. So for lagging body part, throw it in there uh, twice a week. Volume is king. Uh, no matter who you talk to, they'll, they'll probably agree. Now you, you can overtrain and overdo it. You need to throw in or consider rest and repair, but for lagging body parts, volume is king. So that's what we did. Got a little pump action going on there on the old uh, triceps. Remember in the post-workout window, your body has the ability to independent of insulin uptake glucose. So don't be scared of carbs post-workout. I know we get into the this binary system where carbs are bad and fat is good, or we see the t-shirts that say ketones are better than glucose and all that sort of stuff. And I would say that's probably true, but if I was sprinting or a boxer, I'm gonna take glucose over ketones. That's just, that's just me personally. Maybe a ketone ester with glucose. But so in the post-workout uh, window, carbohydrates can be absorbed independent of insulin. And you'll notice for those of you that have relatively good blood sugar regulation, your body fat is kind of where you want it and you're training hard, you're putting the work into the gym, you can afford carbohydrates in the post-workout window and I'll show you my level breath acetone. It doesn't change much friends. It drops a little bit, but you get right back into ketosis. So don't worry so much about that. Uh, now, of course, if you have 50, hundred pounds to lose, you probably don't need a lot of post-workout carbohydrates, maybe just a little bit, if and only if your exercise is very intense. So if you have any questions, hit it below. And then tomorrow in the morning, we're gonna go catch up with Mr. Ben Bickman for part two. Sit up too late editing. Ugh. All right, good morning, guys. So as I mentioned earlier, I think I did. I'm a little tired, as you might be able to tell. Um, I was up late editing videos. What am I doing? I know better than that, man. All right, running, vlogging, probably not the safest thing in the world, but about to, uh, about to go get ready here to meet with Ben Bickman, have to rent a C-stand, which will hold up a light just in case we need it, either for him or for Drew Manning. And uh, one of the first things I like to do, and I, you know, I mean, it has to do with all these non-dietary factors that affect health. You know, when you travel, oftentimes you're going to bed at different times than you normally do. You're waking up earlier or later or whatever. Your circadian rhythm is off. And one way you can help to re-entrain that, obviously is with, with smart meal timing, like Alessandro Ferretti has talked about. But the other way that you can entrain your body's rhythms is to get natural sunlight. So first thing in the morning, wherever I am, whenever I'm traveling, as long as there's sun out or even no sun, what I like to do is just get outside and walk. Look right into the sun for at least five to seven minutes. Now that may not be ideal. Uh, you know, of course you want midday sunlight as well. You want sun, I think at all times. Uh, and then to raise your heart rate. So first thing in the morning, whether that's yoga, whether that's walking, Catalysis uh, is very much demand driven and that can be why sometimes people may be frustrated or curious where they go down and exercise before they go down they're in ketosis you know maybe they're one millimolar ketones they get done their exercise bout and they find wait a minute I'm my ketones are lower how can that be it could be that they because that can happen I've seen it happen with a lot of people I know um, who are endurance athletes. I don't know that I've ever seen it with resistance athletes. I've not really ever checked it myself. But what may happen in that context is that that acute um, or chronic, or not so acute, but even if it's a couple hours, we'll call it acute, um, that training bout may be sufficient that their actual rate of ketone use surpassed the rate of ketone production. Mm -hmm. And I can't speak to the rates. I don't know how quickly, you know, mole for mole or molecule for molecule, we can make ketones. But it's pretty easy to conceive that in a high, relatively long-term bout of exercise, high intensity, you very well could be using more ketones than you're making. And if you are a keto-adapted athlete, that may elicit some concern and say, oh, well, now I need to drink my ketones. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe you do need to, um, and I, will, I do mean it, that, that, that could be beneficial. But let's also not ignore the fact that even in the keto-adapted athlete, most of the energy is still coming from fat. 
fat is still accounting for overwhelmingly the muscle's fuel needs. You've just trained, you've trained your muscle cells to use fat at higher intensities than average, which is a very good effect. That's a very good um, adaptation. All right, guys, just wrapped up with Ben Bickman. Gosh, he's such a nice guy, so giving. We covered a lot of new things we didn't talk about back in that interview in September. So uh, I'm gonna cut to some snippets here in a minute. But you know, I think the big takeaways for me, I need to re-listen to it, but uh, context is everything. You know, oftentimes we get wrapped up in, um, you know, having high ketone levels or taking MCT oil or taking exogenous ketones and he provides a really compelling argument that context and application is specific and important. Uh, you know, we talked about the high prevalence of the CPT1, the carnitine palmitoyl transferase, I think it is the acronym, what it stands for, uh, gene, that SNP, and how some people are saying on the internet, we'll see that example in these Eskimos is a good reason why you shouldn't be keto. But in that specific environment, that genotype may be favorable but you probably don't live in that environment. So context is king, it's a lot of fun. So let's cut to some footage, uh, some highlights that I think, particularly around how ketones induce uncoupling in adipose tissue. So when you take your cold shower, you know, part of that is that cold thermogenesis uh, causes uncoupling in both your muscle tissue and your fat tissue. But here's a little segment where Ben talks about how ketones are a little tissue specific. I think it's really cool. So let's cut to that. I'm not looking at cold induced mitochondrial uncoupling. Um, as, as you know, I'm looking at ketone-induced mitochondrial uncoupling. And then that introduces a question where what we see at fat tissue is that beneficial and doesn't even happen in muscle cells. So once again, context is very relevant here. And in fact, we don't see the same thing where we are just about to publish the muscle side of the story and then very soon the fat side. But ketones are inducing mitochondrial uncoupling in fat tissue. It's telling fat tissue it's okay for you to waste energy. In muscle cell, it doesn't have the same effect. There is no increase of mitochondrial uncoupling in muscle tissue. And that is really relevant because someone could say, oh, well, shucks, um, my metabolic rate isn't gonna be as high as it would be otherwise. That's true. If you can uncouple all the mitochondria in your muscles, which by mass is most of what we are made of, mm -hmm. that's a huge effect of increasing your metabolic rate. And yet, of all the places you don't want mitochondrial uncoupling, I would submit, at least for the physically active, it's your muscle cells. Yeah. If I have energy going to my muscle, I want my muscle to only use what it needs to so that when in the midst of a set, if I'm doing my pull-ups or my pistol squats, I want to know I'm going to get as much as I can. My muscle cells are only using their every amount of fat and glucose it's using, it's using it to give me work. So was there ever a point where you're like, oh man, I hope I can get this weight off? Like, did I, did I mess up like thinking <laughs> yeah. that this was, a, did it, like, did you have that fear? 100%, because yeah. here's the thing, my initial goal was to gain 50, maybe 60 pounds, mm -hmm. but I had to go for six months. And so I gained 76 pounds at my heaviest. So I'm like, okay, I'm way over, I overshot my goal. And now I've never had to do this before. I've had to cut weight for wrestling and that's different. Um, I've never had to lose 75 pounds before. Yeah. I've never been in this situation. So, and I had all these people watching me and I had these fears of like, what if it doesn't work? Like, mm -hmm. I'll be seen as a failure, or as a fraud. Like, you know, here's this personal trainer that, you know, teaches people how to lose weight and he can't even lose it himself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I had these doubts and these fears and, but I knew I had to trust in the process and I knew, I knew how to take it one day at a time. And it took me all six months to lose that weight. And there was times where I hit plateaus where I didn't lose weight some weeks and I freaked out. I'm like, okay, here I am a trainer with all the knowledge of how to do this and yet I'm not losing the weight. It's not you know a linear, it's not like every week is exactly the same amount of weight. Mm -hmm. Some weeks I gained weight and I freaked out. Um, and it helped me relate to my clients because I remember clients telling me like, Drew, I'm doing your meal plans, I'm doing your workouts. Like, it's just not showing up on the scale. I'm like, mm -hmm. hey, you're probably, you're probably lying about something. Yeah. You know, you're probably not doing exactly right. And then here I am doing it and I, it's not reflecting on the scale. And uh, I think people put too much emphasis on scale weight, first of all. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you know, it doesn't, oh, it's not black and white where you're going to see just because you work hard and you eat what you're supposed to eat doesn't mean that you're going to see, you know, two pounds lost every week, you know, week after week for six months. Right. So it was really important learning those lessons. Welcome to Hollywood Burbank Airport. We would like to remind you there is no parking at the White Curve. What's up, guys? All right, it's about 10:30 here. 
Uh, just landed in Burbank. Had a great day with Ben Bickman and Drew Manning. I got my silly glasses on here, but they really help, you know. So it's 10.30. Um, you know, there's so much blue light everywhere you go. Uh, in the airport, I'm looking out. Hopefully you can see right behind me. Um, blue lights there in the airplane, etc. So in Burbank, super excited to meet with Dr. Stephen Gundry tomorrow. Been, I read uh, a lot of research on uh, plants and the anti-nutrients that plants make and the defense molecules and the fact that plants may have you know, uh, cognitive capacities and can plan for defenses and, and communicate through their root systems. So I'm super excited to talk to Dr. Gundry tomorrow. But I want to share with you some of the tips that you can use when traveling to stay healthy. So, so after you land, okay, what you want to do is go for a walk. Uh, 10 minutes because your bags are going to take at least 10 minutes to get out, sometimes more depending upon the airport. Um, and it's good to move those legs. So I have camera gear, it's all my cameras that you guys are accustomed to seeing the good footage on. Uh, so I'm lugging those guys around with the microphones and everything like that. Then I have two more bags, tripods, light, etc. But a nice 10 minute walk, it's going to help move that lymph. See, I think. What a lot of people experience is negative health consequences associated with sedentary activity is really from, from stagnant lymph and inflammation associated with that. So, a Stan Efforting, Mark Bell, many people have talked about this, these 10 minute walks. So instead of doing a, a 30 or 45 minute chunk of cardio, split that up into some walks, okay? The other tip, these blue light blocking glasses. I know many people have been promoting these. There's the Swannies, which are really great. I like these when I travel uh, on airplanes because they cover everything. So hopefully I'll be able to sleep well tonight. I'll share with you in the morning what my aura ring says. Oh man, the sidewalk ends here. All right. Oh man, there's no sidewalk. Dang it. All right. I know it's gonna be really dark, but wait till you see these blue lights that are emanating from the outside of the, uh, my hands get tired here. Uh, that are emanating from the outside of the airport. So man, I mean, if you don't make the precautions to eat healthy, to drink filtered water, to bring your minerals, you know, to fast periodically when you travel, it's a recipe for just ill health. Just really sad. So anyway, tomorrow's gonna be great with Dr. Gundry. Super excited to share that with you guys. Oh, that one's mine. The big old tripod bag. It's actually not that heavy when you grab the roller. <laughs> Thank you. You too. Got the yoga mats. Here we get up. Let me show you the supplements here. Got my mild signs clean for the workout. We got uh, Dave Asprey's uh, Pro One CT. I do like this. A few things from Zymes and the T150, really good for the thyroid and the adrenals. Really good about traveling. Um, of course, I took my Myosense melatonin lozenge and a little acetyl L carnitine. I normally get this from Seeking Health, but I was out of it and just had a few of these around. But one thing I didn't touch, I didn't touch that. Don't do that. Got my clean pre workout going. Normally don't do this unless I'm working out, but look at all this camera gear I slept around. All right, so we're about to go meet with Dr. Gundry here. Got the caffeine going. I have about 15 minutes, I'm gonna go outside, get some sun. I think that's the best thing you can do when you travel first thing in the morning. Expose that retina on your skin to the sun. So let's go do it. What can't you live without? Um, you, you can't live without some way of feeding your microbiome. I happen to think that leaves are the best way to do that. You and I evolved from a leaf-eating ape. so. Get yourself some leaves. If you don't have leaves, then I think tubers are by far the next choice. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite tuber? Uh, I actually love Jerusalem artichoke. Mm -hmm. uh, I always have a supply, uh, sunchokes, uh, I always have a supply in my refrigerator that I keep forever. Awesome. That's great. Um, so we know successful people like yourself have a set of rituals to do in the morning uh, that set them up for success for the day. Can you briefly describe, like, what characteristics of your morning routine help you not only have good health and but make you more successful as an entrepreneur, an educator, and author? Uh, my ritual is determined by my dogs at 4.40 in the morning. Uh, one of my Labradoodles jumps on my face. 
and says, okay, let's go. Uh, I have four dogs and we uh, hike about two and a half miles in the hills. And that's, if I don't do that, as my wife reminds me, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just a dog walker. And if I get out in the hills and watch what my dogs do and interacting with their environment, I'm good for the rest of the day. Good for you. So it's the meditation, exercise, sunlight, yeah. you name it. That's awesome. All part of the package. Yeah. And walking against gravity. Um, yes, uphill. Yeah. The more one of the one of the really interesting things about all the blue zones is they live in hills. Uh, and I think we forget that the the effect of working against gravity is probably one of the most important things that we forgot. One second, guys. I lost your mic. I noticed it when you asked the second last question. So can you just ask them the second last question again about the rituals and you don't have to answer it again? So Dr. Gundry, successful people like yourself has a, have a set of routines and habits they do that set up their day first thing in the morning. So what are some characteristics that you do first thing in the morning that help set up your day for health and also success? That's probably fine. just died as soon as you finish the battery. Oh. oh. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you found these vlogs to be reasonably helpful. I know they're super spontaneous and 